بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد رسول الله I begin with the name of Allah all praise belongs to Allah and may peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad for he is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam A long time ago someone told me something very interesting and it didn't make sense when he told me but years later in hindsight it makes a lot of sense What he told me is this religion of Islam it can give you anything that you want whatever you want from this religion it will give it to you If you want to learn the Arabic language this religion will give it to you You will learn how to speak the Arabic language You can speak with people in Egypt You want to go to Fez maybe you can learn the Moroccan dialect or maybe you want to learn the Quran okay there's resources for that as well you can learn the classical Arabic if you want to learn how to speak Arabic this religion will give it to you or maybe you want a tire you want to look like a muslim well there's plenty of that as well you can learn how to dress like a person from west africa you can get a nice jubba and look like someone from cairo you can dress just like those folks in saudi arabia you can play dress up you can get a fancy hat you can get a fancy hijab you can get all the clothes you want if that's what you want from this religion you can get it or maybe you want to learn about architecture You want to travel around the world and visit the most beautiful mosques that the ummah has to offer. We have that as well. You can visit a mosque in Afghanistan that's older than the country you came from. Hmm. You can go to Alhambra and marvel at how the people of Andalus put this together. If you want architecture, this religion has tons of architecture to give you. Now, Arabic attire architecture, that's shallow to some people. That's superficial. I want academics. I want to read a lot of books. I want to go to a lot of colleges. I want to go to universities. I want to get an ijaza. I want to get tons of ijazas. I want to learn everything there is to learn about this religion. This religion will give it to you. If you want to be an academic, Islam has lots of academics to give you. Or maybe you want activism. Islam has activism as well. There's always some type of injustice in the world. There's always some type of oppression. So there's tons of activism for you. You can go to speeches, you can go to protests, you can join a non-profit organization, you can go overseas and give a lecture at the podium. There's so many avenues of activism for you in this religion. If that's what you want, this religion will give you activism. Or maybe what you really want is argumentation. You want to argue. This religion has a lot of that as well. You want to argue with people about the permissibility of celebrating the Maulid. It's halal, it's haram. Or maybe you want to argue with people about where to put your hands when you pray. Should you put your hands at your chest? Should you put your hands right above your belly button? Maybe below your belly button. If you want to argue about that, there's plenty of people who will argue back with you. Or maybe you want to join the mosque board and argue with people about who should be in charge. Who should say the khutbah every Friday? Who should be the president of the mosque? who should be the associate director of the calligraphy program at the mosque everybody is vying for these positions you can be another person to vie for these positions as well so if you want argumentation unfortunately this religion has a lot of argumentation to give you whatever you want this religion has it to give to you now notice there's arabic attire architecture academics activism argumentation all these a's with all these a's There's one big capital A that we're forgetting about. What is that capital A? It's the most important A, and we always seem to forget about this capital A. That capital A is Allah. La ilaha illallah. You have folks who their understanding of Islam is about everything and anything but Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I don't mean to be condescending, I don't mean to be patronizing. but look at the reality of it you can have a person who participates in islamic activism for years for years they become very prominent or you can have a person who becomes an expert in argumentation they can argue with everybody they know the points to say they know how to humiliate them they know how to call them bad names they know everything about islamic argumentation or they know everything about islamic attire you want a jubba i know the best place to get that You want a fancy turban? I know the best place to get that. They know everything about Islamic attire. But if you pull these people to the side and say, "Brother, sister, 
when's the last time you prayed and you actually thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you were praying? When's the last time you prayed and you actually focused on what you were saying in the prayer? When's the last time you prayed and you actually shed a tear while you were praying? These people, if they're honest with themselves, they'll probably say, it's been a while. Some people may say, I've never done those things. They're experts in activism, in academics, in architecture, in argumentation, everything and anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they're not experts in. Everything else they're an expert in. And so it begs the question, what is your practice of Islam all about? Is it about everything but Allah? Isn't that sad? Isn't that unfortunate? That a person can go for years and years practicing this thing called Islam, and it's about everything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty. This is not a new problem. This problem has existed for well over a thousand years. In fact, during the early Muslim generations, they realized that this is a problem. Realized that the first Muslims, for the most part, they were poor. Many of them didn't have money. Many of them didn't have property. They didn't have status in society. And in many cases, by becoming Muslim, they actually lost money. They lost property. They lost status. Imagine some of the early converts to this religion among the companions. By becoming Muslim, that means that your family wants nothing to do with you. That means that your wife may leave you. That means that your children turn their backs on you because you're leaving the religion of your forefathers to become a Muslim. So what you see in these early Muslims is a level of sincerity. I don't care about money. I don't care about status. I don't care about anything. I want to become a Muslim to follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What happened over the centuries, about 100 to 200 years after the Hijrah, Islam spread pretty far and wide. It went to places that people would have never even imagined. All of a sudden, you have Muslims in Persia, you have Muslims in China, you have Muslims as far as Khurasan, which is modern-day Afghanistan, even farther than that. All of a sudden, it became quite advantageous to become a Muslim. If you become a Muslim, you are now part of this prominent culture that's arising. If I'm a Muslim, I can rise up in ranks. I can marry people that I couldn't marry before. I can get zakat money given to me. I can get a job at the Islamic courthouse. And so many Muslims entered the religion because of that. Allah Ta'ala knows their true sincerity, but this is just human nature. When there's a certain culture, a certain society that's in power, everybody wants to gravitate towards that power, that success, that prominence. And so now you find people in the middle of Khurasan who start giving their kids Arabic-sounding names. Their kids are not Arab, but the Arabs are in power, and so we want to have powerful names as well. All of a sudden, you have people as far as Syria wearing Islamic-looking clothing. All of a sudden, you have people enrolling in Islamic institutions. Because if I graduate from this institution, I'll be prominent. I'll get a good job. I'll have a status in society. That's what was happening during the 2nd and the 3rd century after Hijrah for the Muslims. And so some of the ulama, some of the scholars, they said, wait a minute. It seems like people are practicing this religion for everything and anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you become a Muslim and you're good at practicing being a Muslim, you can marry up. You can get a good job. You can move to a thriving city. It seems like... People are forgetting what this religion is about in the first place. It's about getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so these folks, they put together a science that's called at To show people, what is this religion all about in the first place? Is this about all these other things? No, it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And realize there's many sciences in the religion of Islam. And they all arose in a very similar fashion. There was a problem. There needs to be a solution to this problem. So for example, the science of Tajweed, the science of how to recite the Quran. The early Muslims realized that as Islam spread around the world, there's people who are not Arabs. And they start reciting the Quran and they're mispronouncing these letters. We have to preserve how these letters should be pronounced. And so they came together and developed the science of Tajweed. 
The early Muslims didn't need the science of Tajweed because they pronounced the letters naturally. However, that's no longer the case. We have to preserve how to recite the Quran properly. Likewise, Al-Ughatul Arabiya, the Arabic language. There's many people who are becoming Muslim and they don't know how to speak Arabic properly. And so what happens is they read the Quran, they read the Hadiths, and they're misinterpreting what these texts are saying. We can't let that happen. We have to preserve the Arabic language. Because if you don't have the Arabic language, you then lose the meanings of the Quran and the Hadiths. And so this science was developed. Sarf, Nahu, Balagha, which is morphology, grammar, rhetoric, and so on. Likewise, Aqidah, theology, what we believe as Muslims. Again, as you spread out across the world, you start encountering very strange beliefs. And you have people who, they're Muslim, but they're holding on to these old beliefs that they had before they were Muslims. We have to formally address this. What do the Muslims believe? And so the science of Aqidah was formulated. Likewise, fiqh, Islamic law. People have questions. How do I pay zakat? How do I pray? How do I perform wudu? Can I get married to this person? What happens if I get divorced from that person? All these questions came up. How do we address these questions? We have to have a science of fiqh to address these questions. And so all these sciences were developed by the Muslims to address a problem. And tasawwuf is no different. The science of Islamic spirituality is no different. However, fast forward to today. If you want to learn Tajweed, there's many avenues for you to learn Tajweed. If you want to learn the Arabic language, there's many avenues. You want to learn about Aqidah, Fiqh. There's many books written about these things. But when it comes to Tasawwuf, you find that this is the most neglected of all the Islamic sciences. Not only is it the most neglected, it's the most misunderstood of the Islamic sciences. So my hope in this video series is to explain what the Sawwaf is all about. The Sawwaf is about getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, here's the irony in the Sawwaf today. When you talk about the Sawwaf to people, what's the first thing that usually pops up? Maybe it's about celebrating the Mawlid. It's about celebrating the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what the Sawwaf is about. Hmm? To the average person these days. If you ask, that's what they think it's about. Or maybe it's about attending a hadra. A hadra is a circle where people come together and they make dhikr. Oftentimes there's singing. Oftentimes there's drums. That's what the sawaf is about. The hadra. Or the sawaf is about singing qasidas. Qasidas are songs usually in the Arabic language. Sometimes they're in Persian. Sometimes they're in Urdu. That's what the sawwaf is about, singing qasidas, getting our children to sing nasheeds. Or maybe you're not into that kind of stuff. You're not musically inclined. The sawwaf is about finding a sheikh. It's about finding a sheikh and making bay'ah to him, pledging allegiance to a specific sheikh who's going to guide me in this life. That's what the sawwaf is about. Some other people will say the sawwaf is about joining a tariqah. It's about joining a group of people who are students of the sheikh. And we all get together every so often. We wear certain clothing, we recite certain adhkar, and that's what this is about. The sawwaf is about joining a tariqah. Some people may say, the sawwaf is about visiting maqams. It's about going around the world and visiting special shrines and sites that are holy to us. Now look at this list here. All of this looks nice. We can debate back and forth whether this is halal, whether this is bid'ah, whether this is haram. But look at this list. This is the sawwaf. Huh? This looks mysteriously like the other list that we looked at at the beginning of this video. Where people think Islam is about everything and anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is the sawwaf about celebrating the maulid? It could be. Is the sawwaf about attending a hadra, singing nasheeds, finding a shaykh, joining a tariqah? It could be. But is that really what the sawwaf is about? No. The sawwaf is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the sawwaf is about. All these other things, they're nice. But if you get lost in them, and they don't get you any closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what good are they? What good is this? Is this what the religion is about? Everything and anything 
except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll end this video with this uh, little anecdote. I remember someone said that their son, he's a little bit of a bookworm. All he does is read books. He's very intellectual. And so this person said, I enrolled my son into basketball camp because, you know, he doesn't even get out. He doesn't play any sports. So maybe if he joins basketball camp, he will become a little bit more athletic, a little bit more brawny, less brain, more brawn. So he enrolled his son into basketball camp. And about two months into it, he called his son up and he said, hey, how's, uh, how's it going? And his son said, it's okay. It's, it's all right. And the father says, well, tell me what you've been doing. The son says, well, I learned a lot of things so far. I learned who founded basketball. I learned the early rules of basketball. I learned about how basketball evolved over the years and how new rules were implemented. How the three-pointer wasn't originally in the early years of basketball, and then they implemented the three-pointer later on. I learned about all the different historical teams. I learned about their colors. I learned about their mascots. I learned about where they're located. I learned a lot about basketball. And the father said, wait a minute, how's your jump shot? And the son said, oh, I don't know. I never actually picked up a basketball. This is a silly story, but it's not so silly because this actually describes how many Muslims practice this religion. Some people practice Islam for years and they learn how to speak like a Muslim, how to look like a Muslim, how to act like a Muslim. They know which mosque to go to and which mosque not to go to. They know how to argue with people online. They learn about the Mawlid. They learn about the Hadra. They learn about the Tariqa. They learn everything about this religion except the purpose of this religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the purpose of this religion. Just like this young man goes to basketball camp and he learns everything about basketball. And yet he never picks up a basketball in the first place. Is that what the religion is about? The scholars of the Sawaf said no. That's not what the religion is about. This religion is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you get closer to Allah? We talk about Allah sometimes, but how many of us talk to Allah? That is the problem, and the science of the Sawaf was formulated to solve this problem that we all have. Many of us don't talk about it, but it's there. It's deep in the heart of our hearts. We don't talk about it because it's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. I've been praying for 10 years, 20 years, and I don't even think about Allah when I pray. I've been fasting for my entire adult life, and all I get from it is thirst and hunger. Is this what the religion is? The scholars of the Sawaf say, no, this is not what the religion is. And so we hope to give you a taste of what the Sawaf is through this video series, inshallah ta'ala. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ala ushabihi wa ala atba'ihi hatta yamul qiyamati wa salam tasliman kathirah.